Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Briz Science, the last Briz Science of 2020. It is, of course, Christmas time, so we're getting suitably festive here. Um, tonight, we have a very special Briz Science for you, which I'll introduce for you in a moment. I'm your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore. Briz Science is, of course, brought to you by the University of Queensland, our wonderful event partners who have been here for over a decade. We're very excited to be here online. And of course, we want to pay respects to the traditional owners of the many lands on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders, both past and present, and also acknowledge those whose ongoing efforts to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. As I said, tonight we have a very special evening because to finish off the year, we have not one, not two, not three, but eight speakers for you. And they are, of course, the finalists of UQ's three-minute thesis competition this year. Or not, not almost all of the finalists. It's a, a very curated list. Um, and so they are, they all presented their three-minute thesis topics previously. And tonight they're going to present them for you live. And um, they will be speaking for no prizes if you're playing along at home. Three minutes, after which I will use my MC privileges to ask one, maybe two questions, and then we'll be on to the next speaker. But there will be an opportunity for you, the British Science audience, to ask your own questions of our speakers at the end of the talk. We've got plenty of time at the end. So I'd encourage you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer or probably similar on your mobile. Uh, the Q&A function, not the chat, the Q&A. Put your question in there, and if possible, if you could put the name of the speaker that you'd like to ask that question of. It's probably going to be fairly clear whether you're asking about computational physics or echidna poo, but uh, we just don't want any confusion there. So um, I think that is all that you need to get started. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker for the night. Our lucky first speaker is Isaac Towers, who is a plant ecologist working at UQ's School of Biological Sciences. And he's going to be presenting tonight on his thesis, Plants, Species Diversity and Officers. Take it away, Isaac. Uh, thank you very much, Joel. So if you've ever had to work in an office, then you know how productive you can be when you're sitting at the right desk. Uh, it might be next to the window or near the coffee machine, but at the end of the day, whether it's the right desk for you will depend on who you are as a person because we all have our own creature comfort. Thus, having a flexible workspace with a variety of different desk spaces might be the best way to keep a diverse group of people productive and happy. Now, if you're wondering how this relates to biology, I'm not surprised, but as it turns out, this workplace scenario is actually a pretty apt metaphor for one of the theories we use to explain why some ecosystems have more species than others. You see, one of the burning questions in ecology right now is how 10, 20, or sometimes over 100 different species are able to live next to one another without driving each other extinct. Um, and this question becomes particularly difficult when we start talking about plants, which are often extraordinarily diverse, even though they compete for just sunlight, water, and a handful of soil nutrients. But just like having a variety of desks may be able to keep a group of people productive, it is theorized that having a variety of environmental conditions in an ecosystem may be able to keep a group of species from going extinct, assuming that they all have their own environmental preferences. Uh, we refer to this concept as spatial variation in the environment. Uh, now, at this point, you may be asking, well, what exactly does spatial variation in the environment look like? Well, to give you an idea, this is a photo of my study system, which I've just shared to you now, and I hope that's coming up now. Um, and uh, so what we have here is the beautiful wildflower understory of the York Gum Woodlands in southwest Western Australia. And using our workplace metaphor again, we can think of the entire landscape as being the office. And your desk might be represented by whether, say, you're under this big tree here um, or next to a log. And what's particularly striking about this photo is that it seems to demonstrate two species, uh, this yellow flower um, underneath the trees and this white flower sharing the landscape based on what the environmental conditions are like in their immediate vicinity. And so my PhD aims to investigate whether spatial variation in the environment allows not just these two species, but a whole range of different species to exist simultaneously within this forest. Um, and so to do this, 
What I did was I measured how different stages in the annual plant life cycle varied across a range of environmental conditions in the field. And if after analyzing these data, I find that species respond in different ways to things like the amount of canopy cover or the amount of leaf litter, it will provide evidence that spatial variation in the environment helps to promote diversity in the York gum woodlands. Uh, my research has important implications for the way in which we approach conserving and restoring degraded forests, not just in Southwest Western Australia, but also around the world. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, right on your three minutes. That's wonderful. So, um, I think, how um, how different is this in different um, forest environments? Is it going to be very different in different countries? You mentioned in an international focus. How do you go about that kind of research? Right. Yeah. So um, at the moment, uh, we're actually um, uh, at the sort of forefront of this research at the moment. This doesn't actually get investigated a huge amount. Um, and, but one of our leading hypotheses at the moment is that um, this spatial variation effect. So, you know, preferring to be under a tree or, you know, being out in the open will become stronger in environments um, which are more stressful. So, for example, you can imagine in a really nice moist forest, um, being out in the super hot sun um, or being under a tree might not matter as much. Um, but when you go to somewhere like Southwest Western Australia, where it's very arid and has potential to get very hot, um, that might make really make a difference for species to try and seek out these um, small refugia where they're able to survive much better. Um, and so, yeah, one of our expectations and something that we want to investigate is, uh, you know, if we compare two different forests with different um, sort of regional environmental conditions, will the local effects come out more strongly in one versus the other? Fantastic. Well, I hope you enjoy your field work and you get a good mix of office and uh, being outside. Likewise, yeah. <laughs> Great. All right, thank you so much, Isaac. I'm sure we'll be back with more questions at the end. So everyone, now's a chance to use your Q&A function to put those questions in. But let us move on to our next speaker, who is Raz Baizarin Rosalie, who is a computational chemistry researcher at UQ, working to gather atomic level insight where experiments cannot go. And tonight, she's talking about her thesis, Destination Rapid Drug Discovery. Over to you, Raz. Thank you for the introduction. So one of the humanity's greatest challenges is the need to overcome and fight diseases. Heart disease and stroke have remained the leading causes of death for the last 15 years, and were responsible for half of the death worldwide. On top of what we are fighting, new diseases continue to appear. COVID-19 has resulted in more than 1.5 million of deaths over the past 12 months. The process of research and developing new, new drugs is linked and growing in difficulty. It takes on average more than 20 years for a new drug to complete the journey from initial discovery to the marketplace. The average cost to develop each successful drug is estimated to be $2.6 billion. So a key question is therefore, how do we lower the time and the cost of the drug discovery? So, here in my research, I use computer modeling. I use computer modeling to study the interaction of drugs and protein. So most drugs act at a specific site of protein, which we usually call the binding pocket. In order, in order the drug to be effective, it needs to fit the shape of the binding pocket like a key fitting into the lock. But to have an effect, a drug must bind tightly, but not too tightly, it's a fine balance. With the help of advanced 3D computer modeling, my calculation, we can visualize and understand how a drug binds to a protein as shown on the screen here. If we think of a drug molecule, there. It has many parts which consist of different group of atoms that could interact with protein. But which ones are important? Changing one particular aspect of the drug at a time can be time consuming and expensive task in laboratory. So here in my research, I want to design a new technique that could rapidly predict the interaction between drug and protein. So my calculation can quantify the strength 
of interaction between drugs and protein. So we can use this quantity as a fast predictive tool to predict whether the drug will react or not. For example, if you are given six months to make new molecules in the lab, you could only get a handful number and it is not known whether the molecules are safe or could interact with protein. Meanwhile, with computer modeling, within the same time frame, maybe hundreds to thousands of molecules can be designed and examined. Now we are actually looking at a pile of keys for the one key that fit the lock. In future, we hope to accelerate this process by using artificial intelligence to make new discoveries faster that could lead to cure for a range of diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Raz. Great presentation and, of course, very topical these days. Um, uh, question, how do you find working with experimentalists? Do you have a, a close relationship with experimental groups that are actually you know, making these molecules and drugs that you then do your computational work on? Oh, so for now, we are, we are using the... So for my drug discovery process, um, we actually just use the, pre, the study that's been published. And then from there, we try to replicate those kind of like, this kind of interaction so that we could derive a properties that could actually predict rapidly. Right, right. Uh, I think it's a wonderful area to work in and some really exciting advances coming out of there. So I'm looking forward to seeing your papers and hopefully taking the drugs that your lab helps to eventually produce. All right, uh, thank you so much, Raz. Fantastic job. Let's go to our next speaker, who is Hao Yu Shi from the School of Veterinary Sciences at UQ, whose research focuses on human-dog interactions. And tonight, He's going to explain how your personality affects the leash tension when walking dogs. How are you? Take it away. Thank you, Joe, for the introduction. So I'll first share the screen. So have you ever walked a dog? Who do you look like? The shiny superstar like the picture on your left? Or the funny clumsy clown like the gentleman on your left? Dog owners usually complain about their dogs for being lunging when working on leash. In fact, putting too much pressure on the neck of your dog can potentially damage its muscles, trachea, and even eyes. But you know what? It is not only your dog, but also you who play an important role on the other end of the leash. Different owners interact with their dogs differently, which is affected by our personality. Well, just like our daily interaction with other people, you may notice that Outgoing people are generally more talkative, or you may also be able to tell whether a person tends to be nervous or not by looking at their body languages. As a dog owner myself, I'm really concerned about the health of my dogs and also the welfare of my dogs. After all, no owner wants their dog to suffer when going for a walk, which is supposed to be a happy activity that both you and your dogs enjoy, right? As a result, I've been dedicating several years of my life exploring how different people behave when walking their dogs on leash. I've developed a device called Leash Tension Meter. This device records the forces exerted on the leash and also it differentiates the direction of the force. So by using this Leash Tension Meter, we were able to tell whether it was the person or the dog was pulling on leash and also how strong is the person and the dog pulling on leash. I used this device to monitor a group of people walking different types of dogs and correlated the tension of a leash with individual's personality. And my results show that people who tended to be nervous and outgoing pull the leash harder, while those who are more careful pull the leash less frequently. And for dogs, dogs launch more when walking with nervous and outgoing people. In addition, they pull more frequently when walking with open-minded people but less frequently when with considerate head nervous. This study is a relief for many dogs claim lunging by their owners because it demonstrates that your dog may be a victim that is influenced by your personality. So 
Next time before you're complaining, how come my dog's always so poorly on the leash? Well, ask yourself, what type of personality do you have? Am I overly pulling on leash? Adjust yourself and enjoy a lovely daily walk with your dog. Thank you. Thank you, how are you? My, my dog spot is very uh, intrigued by this conversation, but I'm not sure I want him to hear the answers to these questions. Um, but I actually wanted to know, one of the things we talk about um, a lot with research, we talk a lot about the outcomes, but sometimes coming up with the question is actually the hard part. Uh, how did you come up to find this research topic as something that was new and to research? What was your sort of interest here? Well, so first of all, I'm interested in human-animal interaction. And the reason is that uh, at first I'm very interested in animal welfare and I care a lot of, about animal welfare. But uh, during my undergraduate school, when I'm studying veterinary medicine, I realized that it's not only the, we should not only focus on the animal parts because human play a really important role in this kind of interaction. And this kind of interaction can not only affect the animal welfare, but also the quality of life of human. And this is more like a dyadic interaction. So I think that instead of just focusing on human, we should more like to, to, to promote that this dyadic interaction can also benefit humans. So in this case, humans are more likely to um, care about and really do something to promote animal welfare. And so the reason why I, I'm interested in um, the leash pulling is because that this reactivity or dogs being reactive to other dogs when on leash is a very important uh, factor that people relinquish their dogs to shelters. So I'm thinking that by um, addressing this kind of question, we can also improve the animal welfare and also improve the interactions between owners and their dogs. Oh, it's fantastic. Great to see sort of science crossing lots of different disciplines to bring those stories together. Um, Spot's excited too. Um, thank you so much, Haoshu. Uh, how are you? Pardon me. And um, uh, all the best with your research. Okay, next up, I'd like to introduce Jessa Thurman, who is an entomologist by trade um, and who admires the diversity of insects that support our planet. And tonight she is speaking about bringing diversity to a green desert. Please welcome Jessa. Thank you. Um, just gonna share green. Okay, there, sorry. If you think this landscape is beautiful, you're not alone. It's neat and uniform, it's seemingly endless, and it's potentially quite profitable. But this is our idealized landscape, agriculture, and it is the perfect place to be a pest. Certain insects thrive in landscapes like these, and this is where their host plant is in abundance. However, this landscape can be just as equally hostile to other animals. And that is problematic in more ways than you may imagine. First, the natural enemies of our pests struggle to survive here and are unable to pro provide the pest suppression that, um, that we normally see in nature. And second, to deal with our pests, we primarily spray chemical insecticides, which, can, uh, which, are, which are failing us as pests gain resistance to them and as they have non-target effects on other animals. And what we're left with, in essence, is a green desert. And you can find more and more of these green deserts as agriculture now occupies roughly one third of all ice-free land on Earth. And we've tried to fix this. So we've typically done this by releasing other natural enemies onto the farm. And as you can imagine, this has had variable success. But some specialist natural enemies like parasitic wasps can provide valuable and reliable pest control. However, those wasps once, once released into this landscape struggle to survive here. And farmers are left with having to buy and release these wasps continuously. So in order to actually fix this problem rather than just band-aiding over, over it, um, I've started to do research on how we can have a more ecological basis uh, for, for fighting this. So first I've started to look at the edges of the farms to see what natural enemies are left and what habitat is left. And if those natural enemies are potentially spilling over onto the farm and providing us with valuable pest control. 
So far, what I found is that there are natural enemies left in some of these edge habitats. But quality really matters when it comes to what habitat is left. And most of the farms don't have necessarily have quality habitat left in the fringes. The natural enemies that are left in, in quality habitats can provide valuable pest control. However, it's mostly those parasitic wasps that are being released that provide us with pest control on farms. So considering this, the next stages of my research is looking at providing habitat on the farm, that pro uh, which will provide the necessary nectar and shelter resources that we know our natural enemies need from other research. Now, these steps may seem small, but they work towards increasing the diversity on these farms and could potentially um, uh, increase our crop yields. So with a planet cultivated for human life, I think it's time that we let some others in. Thank you. Thank you, Jessa. Fantastic presentation, really exciting research. So how do, how do farmers respond to some of this research? Are they excited about sort of new opportunities for the farm and potentially you know, lower cost controls or yeah, absolutely. So something interesting from my research that's revealed is smaller scale farmers, they already get this natural pest control and they tend to have quality habitat near their farm. But larger scale farms, which provide most of your, your, your organic and inorganic um, produce at Woolworths or Coles or wherever you may get your, your produce from, they do not get that pest control and they can spend, one of my farms um, spends between one to $1.5 million on pest control. This alternative could get them down to less than $100,000 um, in terms of the options we have. So yes, they're very interested and they've let me do these experiments on their farms, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, fantastic. It's, it's again, you know, this linking just science with practical outcomes. It's wonderful to see that research um, coming to fruition. So all the best with your project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right, and don't forget, if you've got questions for our speakers tonight, like Jessa, you can pop them in the Q&A box down the bottom. Put them in now so you don't forget about them later, because we do have a lot of speakers tonight. All right, next up uh, is Scott Spilius, who spent the better part of his 20s sailing the world as a science communicator, but was so inspired by declines in ocean ecosystems that he actually became a researcher at the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at UQ, and leading him tonight to talking about the seaweed revolution. Please welcome Scott Spilius. Thanks, Joel. Uh, thanks for the great introduction. All right, everybody, I'm here to tell you that modern human societies are stuck. We are in a state of arrested development. See, we never stopped being hunter-gatherers. Now, don't worry, I know about the agricultural revolution which happened 12,000 years ago. What I'm talking about is this, the ocean. See, when it comes to that thing covering most of our planet, we're still just basically hunting and gathering. I mean, how many ocean farmers do any of you know? But this is all set to change because right now we're standing on the cusp of a revolution in how we manage the earth. You see, we figured out that when grown at large scale in the ocean, seaweeds can not only help to directly feed our growing population, but can also address many of the pressing problems that we face today. You worried about drought? Well, it turns out a seaweed solution sprayed on crops can supercharge their drought tolerance. Plastic pollution? We figured out how to make sustainable bioplastics from seaweed extracts. Climate change? Some seaweeds grow so fast, they could potentially draw down gigatons of carbon. And when it comes to those pesky cows farting out too much methane, a little bit of seaweed in their diet can clear that right up. Seriously. Sounds great, right? But I know what you're thinking. Modern day agricultural practices, as we've just heard, have done untold damage na to, to nature and the climate. So how do we avoid making the same mistakes when we start cultivating the ocean? It's a great question, and that's exactly what I'm studying in my PhD. So the reality is, despite all the promise, we don't really know much about the indirect impacts that large-scale seaweed cultivations will have. So to fill this gap, I'm engaging with diverse groups of stakeholders and using systems models to try to map out all of the possible impacts and the extent to which we value them. 
For example, it could be that growing more seaweed in the ocean displaces the need to set aside land for crops, which would be a win-win, right? But will this come at the cost of disrupted marine systems or will it marginalize groups of people? And are these trade-offs that we're willing to make? Knowing how much we value one consequence over another and how they relate will be critical to making informed choices about how and where we should go about growing seaweed and ultimately about who's gonna benefit. Without considering all of this at the outset, we run the risk that the numerous benefits of the seaweed revolution, rather than flowing to the many, will be constrained to the few. And the timing of all this is important too, because despite the uncharted waters ahead, governments and private interests are already sailing full steam on a course to develop the seas. Work like mine is needed to fill in the chart, to show decision makers where along our course the dangers lie and the treasures found. So that when we've reached that distant shore, when we finally move past being hunter-gatherers, we will have cultivated a world that is more plentiful for both people, nature, and the ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Fantastic presentation and uh, love the puns throughout. Um, got a great future. Um, so what is the sort of you know, when governments are trying to make these sort of decisions, what kind of information do they need to be considering? Um, you mentioned that, you know, there's these trade-offs around disrupting marine um, areas. How, how, do you, how do you start to quantify and make those decisions? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, in really broad terms, it starts with what we'd call the triple bottom line. So thinking about environmental consequences, social consequences, and economic consequences. And what I'm trying to do is figure out, try to flesh out what those look like in the specifics, trying to figure out on local scales what they might look like um, so that we have a better understanding of what those are going to be, especially because just like we learned in the last talk, there's a lot of impacts that come from having these cultivations um, in terrestrial systems and the same will be in, in the ocean. And it's going to be very context dependent. So we're going to need to understand local scenarios and we're going to need to understand what it's going to look like at those small local scales um, and that's going to be a big challenge moving forward but it's something that has to be done before we really go uh, all in on cultivating the ocean. Oh, fantastic I'm really excited uh, to see the next stages of your research and uh, all the best. Oh. And there's a storm outside so if I drop off then you know my power's gone but I'm sure we'll be fine. All right um, so let us go to our next speaker, who is Prashamsa Koirala, who is from the School of Chemistry and Molecular Biosciences, where she's working to develop vaccine antigens against several kinds of diseases. In particular, tonight she'll talk about her thesis, Development of Vaccine Antigen Against GAS Bacterium. Please welcome Prashamsa. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. So I hope all of you have had a very wonderful day today. So uh, before jumping right into my talk, I would like to discuss briefly about the topic of my project, what is gas? So gas is definitely not what you are thinking. It's definitely not a gas stove or gas station. It is rather a very spiteful disease, spiteful bacteria that can cause a uh, uh, very dreadful disease like rheumatic heart disease when not treated timely. So yes, the full form of this gas is group A streptococcus. And uh, this group A streptococcus, uh, when you are not careful, can give you a sore throat. So sore throat, this is just a sore throat. Maybe you are thinking it's you can heal this by only drinking a hot water with a drop of lemon or a hint of ginger on it, but it's not that simple. Actually, um, this bacteria uh, can lead uh, to a very fatal disease if you are not careful, which is called rheumatic heart disease. So in my project, I will be developing uh, a peptide-based subunit vaccine uh, to treat uh, uh, this uh, group A streptococcus infection. So this uh, 
uh, peptide-based sub subunit vaccines. Uh, here, we will be developing a peptide, which is called Padre J8, which is specific to group A streptococcus. So why not we develop a traditional type of simple vaccine? Because these vaccines are very uh, commonly found uh, to cause autoimmune responses. So uh, that's why we are developing this peptide-based subunit vaccine. So this vaccine by themselves, sadly, is not very, very uh, effective uh, uh, to give the required responses. So what we are going to do is uh, uh, conjugate this peptide with a carrier, uh, and this carrier happens to be several types of polymers. So uh, after conjugating them, uh, we will be developing three different shapes of uh, vaccine candidates, that is sphere, rod, and worm shapes. And uh, so right now we have already assessed their ability to treat uh, group A streptococcus and uh, very, and we were very successful in doing so. And uh, we found out that the rod-shaped vaccine candidate were the best among all of the shapes, which were even more, um, ha which gave even more higher responses compared to other uh, other shapes, uh, and it gave more higher responses uh, than the positive control that are easily found in the market. So, uh, so to conclude, uh, I would like to say that peptide-based subunit vaccine is very beneficial uh, to treat uh, this uh, group A streptococcus. And uh, thank you. Have a nice time ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prashamsa, for coming this evening and really exciting research. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what's the process of, you know, these different candidates you have? What was the process of deciding which candidates to do that next stage of research on or how do you go about developing those? Yeah, actually, uh, when we look at the uh, several papers that has already been published, they have also done this type of research, but not particularly uh, the vaccine antigen. Uh, they have said that when the rod shaped polymers uh, are injected to the body and uh, they found out that the biodistribution was very high on spleen, which, uh, which obviously gives the best immune responses. So we thought why not use these types of uh, different shapes of polymers uh, to conjugate to our actual antigen and check its responses against group A streptococcus. And uh, as a result, we were able to get the similar types of results yeah fantastic thank you so much for sharing those insights tonight and um look forward to some more questions yeah. at the end yeah sure <laughs> thank you thank you all right next up we have philip shadwala who is from the school of veterinary science at uq and he is a veterinarian conducting research into infectious diseases epidemiology and tonight, he'll be talking about his work towards zero dog mediated rabies deaths in Nigeria by 2030. Please welcome Philip. Good evening, everyone. And thanks, uh, Joel, for the introduction. I would like to provide an overview of my PhD thesis that I entitled Towards Zero Dog Mediated Rabies Death in Nigeria by 2030. As a way of introduction, rabies is an acute progressive viral encephalitis caused by the rabies virus a single-stranded negative sense RNA virus that affects all warm-blooded animals. In most developing countries, rabies is transmitted through dog bites. Globally, over 59,000 people die each year due to rabies, and a vast majority of the victims are in Asia and Africa, where children less than 15 years of age are most disproportionately affected. In the year 2015, there was a call by the Global Alliance for Rabies Control, the World Health Organization, and other partner agencies for zero death from dog mediated rabies by 2030. In order to attain this goal, a number of factors were put forward as prerequisites. One is to enhance surveillance capacity. Two is to provide life-saving vaccines to communities most at risk. Three is to boost community knowledge about rabies, among others. Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa with a population of over 200 million people. And data available from the Nigerian Center for Disease Control indicates that each year about 10,000 people die due to rabies in Nigeria. Outcome from the systematic review we carried out as part of this study indicates that despite increase in reported cases of rabies in humans and animals in Nigeria, 
Factors deriving rabies transmission across space and time in Nigeria is unknown. It is against this background, this study is designed to provide a comprehensive understanding of rabies epidemiology in Nigeria to guide the 2030 Elimination Action Plan in Nigeria. In this study, we aim to use one health approach using data from human, animal, and environment to quantify the role of potential risk factors for rabies transmission across Nigeria, understand geographical and temporal patterns of rabies, and finally, to highlight areas of high risk and dictated clusters in order to provide evidence to the Nigerian government to guide the 2030 Elimination Action Plan in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. So what, um, yeah, what sort of techniques do you have to use, you know, if, to, to have a complete elimination, that sounds like a, a, a pretty huge goal. Um, you know, is this something that will be government led, do you think, or will it be a, a group of, you know, sort of building community support? Yeah, the, for you, the elimination of uh, dog rabies, for you to eliminate dog rabies, we need to ensure that 70% uh, of dog population are vaccinated in rabies endemic countries. So what we are trying to provide at this stage is to provide evidence. Where do we, because we have limited resources in Africa and we need to channel these resources to areas needing these resources. So what we aim to do in, in this uh, PhD is to highlight those areas so that limited resources can be channeled to support the control. Uh, uh, policy related uh, PhD, we are trying to provide evidence to the government. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like really important work that has the potential to have a huge impact. So um, all the best with it. I'm sure there'll be some questions later as well. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Philip. Okay. And now we are on to our last speaker. Yes, it definitely is our last speaker, Kate Dutton Register. Um, Kate can't actually present tonight, but we do have a recording of her presentation from last time. And Kate is uh, uh, on the road to becoming a wildlife conservation scientist. And tonight she's talking about a poo's purpose, understanding the reproduction of echidnas. So take it away, virtual Kate. What comes to mind when you think of poo? It's smelly, it's yucky, it's a waste product with no apparent use. But I'm here to tell you different. Poo can have a purpose. It's actually a really valuable tool for wildlife biologists like me who want to understand more about the reproductive biology of a species. So over the past two years, I have collected lots and lots and lots of poo from the short-beaked echidna. Reproductively, the short-beaked echidna is a fascinating species. While classed as mammals, they possess this weird yet wonderful mix of both mammalian and reptilian features. So while they produce milk to feed their young, like all mammals do, they lay eggs just like birds and reptiles. Despite this unique biology, we know very little about the finer details of short-beaked echidna reproductive biology. How long is the estrus cycle? And how many cycles can they have each breeding season? And is ovulation, or the release of an egg from the ovary spontaneous, or is it induced, requiring the presence of a male? So why is this important? Well, without knowledge of this key information, captive breeding becomes difficult. So not surprisingly, very few baby short-beaked echidnas, otherwise known as puggles, have been born in captivity. This is also the case for the three critically endangered species of long-beaked echidna, which have never reproduced in captivity. My PhD hopes to change this using the power of poo. Using the 2,000 or so faecal samples I've collected, my job now is to analyze these for the reproductive hormones estrogen and progesterone. By mapping changes in the concentrations of these two hormones during the breeding season, we can begin to answer the many questions we have about short-beaked echidna reproductive biology. Using progesterone, preliminary results suggest a maximum of two estrous cycles per breeding season, and that the latil phase, or the second half of the estrous cycle, is 14 to 16 days long. To complete our understanding of the estrous cycle, my next step is to analyze these samples for estrogen to determine the length of the follicular, or the first half, of the estrous cycle. 
Ultimately, by building a clear understanding of short vector kidney reproductive biology, we can help the zoo industry to make adjustments to the way they approach captive breeding of this species. Further, the knowledge gained will serve as a valuable model to better understand reproduction in the long beaked echidna so that we can work towards removing them from the critically endangered list. So next time you think of poo, I hope you remember that poo does have a purpose. Well, there is some fantastic dinner table conversation for Christmas Day. Um, now, Kate, I think you might now be online for some for a question or two. Yeah, I am here now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Kate. Thanks so much for joining us. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so, look, I, I'm going to have to ask the, the blunt question. How do you go about collecting all that echidna poo? Uh, are, are you sort of you out there, you know, like trawling the landscape? Do you sort of hunt, follow an echidna down and wait for that opportune <laughs> moment? No, so it's it's a lot easier for me because I'm working with a captive population at Corumban Wildlife Sanctuary. So they're all contained in their enclosures and just every morning I go and pick up their poo. Uh, you do have to dig around a lot to find it because they do tend to bury it under the sand. So it can be quite challenging to actually find the samples sometimes, yeah. So uh, is this something, in terms of reproduction and echidnas, is that something that is sort of a, 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 a hot topic of research or is it sort of our echidnas niche enough that we just don't know enough yet? Yeah, more the latter. We just, it's just fundamental research I'm working on, just things that we just simply don't know. And yeah, we have had trouble breeding them in captivity in the past. Uh, so we are slowly building the pieces, understanding their reproduction more and we are having significant improvements in getting them to breed in captivity. Oh, fantastic. Um, really exciting research again and must be a lot of fun going and hanging out with uh, the echidnas on a regular basis. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's great. Great. All right. So thank you very much, Kate, for your presentation and then for joining us for questions. So we are now throwing open the doors, Bris Science. If you have a question, you can now post it in the Q&A and we will get through those if we have the time. Um, I'm just going to jump in with the first question, which is for Scott. This is from Peter. And he would like to know, Scott, do we know how seaweed is affected by nutrient runoff and ocean warming? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that, Pete. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of what is going to, how it's going to be impacted by both those things. So uh, first off, runoff from uh, rivers, nutrients, Generally, we're looking, we think that seaweeds could be a good way of cleaning up those types of things. So we think that uh, eutrophication, which happens in coastal areas and causes dead zones, could be uh, remediated by growing seaweeds in zones like that. Um, it's possible that too much nutrients could have a negative impact, but, or, sorry, well, really too much, like excessively too much, but um, they could be helpful in that sense. Um, climate change. Uh, depending on the species, probably warming waters are going to be bad for seaweeds. We've already lost um, something like over 90% of the kelps in off, off the coast of Tasmania. Um, so it just depends on the species. Some species are adapted to cold waters, some to warm waters. And as the climate changes and temperatures change, then you're going to start to see rain shifts like we would with any other organism. Great. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, it was a question for Isaac here, which I think you actually answered on a chat, but um, maybe you could just share with everyone. The question for Isaac was, how different is this concept to ecological niche? Um, so perhaps you just expand on that a little. Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Um, so I guess when we talk about an ecological niche, uh, what we're referring to usually, because there's a lot of different definitions is that um, sort of the abiotic and sometimes bi biotic conditions under which an uh, a species is able to um, thrive, uh, survive and grow and reproduce. And so um, this concept, spatial variation of the environment or spatial sorting is actually just a specific case of ecological niches where um, the niche of this species is defined purely by um, how the environment varies across space. Um, of course, there's a couple of different other axes that um, species can vary over, like um, they might prefer different climates which occur through time, um, or their niche might be defined by the presence of a given pollinator or, um, 
or the absence or presence of a uh, pest. So in this case, it's literally just um, a special case of um, the ecological niche concept, the spatial niche. Great, thank you. Um, question for Hal Yu. Do you find that dogs also have different personalities and does that impact on, or I guess in, in general, does that impact on the, uh, your, your findings? Yeah, there are still argument between uh, different scientists that whether dogs do have personality or not, because based on definition, personality is more like a innate characteristics that has been prolonged for a very long time. So uh, this concept, there are a lot of uh, scientists saying that there may be a personality in dogs there, and they have tried to identify some of personalities and some of them are, for example, like trainability or um, aggression, et cetera. And the other, other scientists prefer to use um, like temperament or behavior to describe their actual presentations. So instead of saying that they have a certain type of temperament, we use that what uh, behaviors do they present in a certain um, stimuli. And yes, uh, behaviors or personality do have a certain effect on their uh, responses to different stimuli. That's why um, like in a shelter environment, they do behavior assessment tests to test their um, dog's responses to like, for example, to to, to a strangers, to, to a doll, or to, to a foreign environment, etc. Great, thanks for that. Really interesting. Um, just looking to see who else we've got questions for, try and sort of, you know, mix it up a little bit here. Um, oh, okay, uh, question for Prashamsa. Do bacteria develop immunity, or I guess evolve immunity, I think might be the context, uh, to vaccines in the same way they do against antibiotics? Uh, sorry, can I, can you please repeat the question? Uh, question was, do bacteria, or maybe can bacteria, evolve immunity to vaccines in the same way that they can evolve immunity to antibiotics? I think yes. Yes, that, that's what we are doing. We are just uh, trying to uh, uh, develop the, trying to produce the required antibodies only against this bacteria so that uh, in later, later, it might be reminded to which kind of antibody to produce. So I think it answers the question. I think so. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, We've got a question from Joe and Jack for Kate. Uh, Kate, can you extrapolate your findings to other similar species, for example, the platypus? <laughs> I wish it was that easy, um, but I doubt it. Uh, every species is very different. Even in all the feline species, uh, there's no consistency. Each individual species of fel felids is so different in their estrous cycle pattern. Um, that it would be probably very wrong for me to say yes. Um, yeah, we definitely just need to get our hands on some platypus and start sampling them to yeah find out what they're doing. Same with the long-beaked echidna. We hope that we can extrapolate some of this um, work to them, but yeah, it's yeah it's something I we have no idea whether they will be similar or just completely different. Yeah. Ah uh, well. Uh, great means there's lots more research to be done. Yeah, plenty more on the monotremes, yeah. How, sorry, this is a question for me. How similar actually is an echidna to a platypus? Like, other than um, being monotremes, are they...? Yeah, they have a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences. I guess the platypus is aquatic, so that's a big difference. Um, the echidna develops a temporary pouch. I don't think the platypus does. They lay their eggs in a nest. Um, yeah, as far as reproduction, they yeah they both have uh, yeah relatively short gestation period and then incubate uh, incubate an egg. So yeah, there's similarities and differences. Yeah. Great. Um, question for I'm going to go to Philip for this next question. Um, well, the question is, you said you need to vaccinate seventy percent of dogs to eliminate rabies. Can you do that 
area by area or do you need to do the whole country at once? Thank you for the question, John. The, yeah, ideal thing is to do it at the nation, as a national vaccination campaign, really. It has to be national, but because of limited resources, we cannot, uh, the government cannot really provide a national vaccination campaign across. So what we're trying to do is, we want to understand where the pockets, where are the areas that, we, that are, are most at risk, really because of limited resources, because you know the, one, of the, uh, one of the challenges in, in developing countries is resources. We are looking at animals that uh, there are a lot of social, social cultural uh, factors associated where people don't really value them. So the government cannot provide vaccination for everybody, for all the dogs within the a given country, uh, in, in the country. So what we are trying to establish is where are these areas where are the areas that are needing resources at this stage so that we'll be able to target the intervention? Great, thank you, Philip. And let's go to Jessa for a question. Should we be incorporating better pest control into our, into our own backyard green deserts? Hi, Joel, that's a great question. And it's been something I've been experimenting myself with. Um, I, I do think that our, our, our backyards are a great potential area for us to have a greater biodiversity. And so you see people adding flowers to their own little veggie patch, and that's fantastic. The, the tricky thing is when you're in a very urbanized area, if it's very developed, if there's not um, sustainable patches nearby and you're not gonna get that diversity. And so, um, ultimately, we do really need this habitat restoration um, on a larger scale, um, but the small steps you can take in your own backyard where you plant flowers, that's, that's a good step, but you won't see that diversity until you make the big steps as well. Uh, thanks. It's, it's a really important point that you know, individual, individuals have a lot to contribute. We also need to work on some of these big problems at the national scale as well, I guess. Same with climate change. Um, <laughs> Okay, fantastic. So look, we, we have just like six minutes left. So I'm gonna throw you one more question and now you've got a, a one minute thesis competition, which is if you were offered, you know, the unlimited budget, you know, Elon Musk flies in, says, I love your, your presentation. Here's a hundred million dollars. What do you do? What's your next big um, research question? What do you buy? What do you research um, either for this project or something else? So, um, I'll go around, but I might throw to Scott first, if you're happy to take the first crack at that, because you're in my top here. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, $100 million, I'm not sure how far that'll get us with ocean farms, because those are going to be very expensive and infrastructure, um, they're going to require a lot. Um, but I think that would be the first step is putting in um, some large scale farms in a few different areas, um, in different contexts, and putting in some really, really heavy duty monitoring programs and adaptive management so we can really get a sense of what the impacts of these are gonna be um, in the environment, but also, also experimenting with management strategies, um, understanding how to shape the culture around the people that work on the ships that are gonna um, work on these places. Um, yeah, so some things like that, just get a, a good idea of what they're actually gonna do because we don't really have a good sense of what it's gonna look like out in the, in the ocean. Yeah, great. Learning by doing. Fantastic. Um, Jessa, what would you do with your windfall? Uh, similar to Scott, I think that that is an impressive amount of money, but it is just a small dent if you want to make global change. So um, I think just starting in Australia would be to, to start up a grant scheme. So this would be based on um, a similar um, program that's been used in Costa Rica for farmers to regenerate habitat in certain areas. And so it would be incentivized in, in places where there's already habitat nearby. And so then we regenerate that habitat, create corridors, which can have benefits to larger animals with spines, but also the invertebrates that I care so much about. And ultimately, I think we would end up seeing that all the space that we're using, we could decrease um, it and get higher yields. Um, but also better quality of produce with less inputs of costs for insecticides. And then, um, yeah, we could, we could still feed everyone, 
but then you better use this land and it would be sustainable by having that grant scheme. Fantastic. Um, how you, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, so the money are probably the first thing we're probably to um, improve or modify the device we're currently using because there's definitely some technical problems that need to be addressed in the future. And in terms of the future research, I think this, uh, I'm hoping you to use this device to in um, um, working dogs and service dogs training because they, it costs a lot to train a service dog and working dogs, but the successful training rate is quite low. So it's about probably 50%, but each dog for the training, it will cost more than thousands or 10,000 money. And so it would be great to improve the unsuccessful training rate. And also the other thing is, I hope that this device can be used in veterinary behavior medicine um, to, to use for diagnosis and also use for um, predictive prognosis in certain types of be uh, behaviors like leash reactivity or aggression, et cetera. Fantastic. Kate, what would you do? Uh, I had I would head straight over to Papua New Guinea and set up a breeding facility for the long beaked echidnas over there. Uh, it's it's my life's ambition to make that happen and get the long beaked echidna breeding in captivity over there because they're so critically endangered. So that's my that would be yeah first thing I'd do yeah. Oh, sounds fantastic. Um, and Philip. All right. Uh, if I. I have that uh, capacity or that uh, money. First of all, what I will do is to enhance uh, surveillance capacity. When I say enhance surveillance capacities, capacities part of the, the outcome from our initial analysis, we understand that uh, the whole of the country, for example, Nigeria has 36 states plus the federal capital. Only one state has capacity for testing. So what I will do is to establish diagnostic centers across states in order to support uh, diagnosis to provide evidence. And secondly, I'll be, I'll be able to carry out a capacity building, train people who will be able to carry out this uh, surveillance because once we have data, support action. Great. Um, and finally, last but not least, Prashamsa, what would you do with your, your research grant? Um, so since my lab is completely based on developing different vaccine candidates against different diseases, so COVID-19 being the hot topic right now, I think I would invest my whole skill and the whole money in developing the COVID-19 vaccine to develop a 100% effective COVID-19 vaccine, I think, yes. <laughs> well, we'll be cheering for you if you do. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, look, that brings us to the end of our three-minute thesis Briz Science special and indeed for Briz Science for 2020. But there is lots more you can still, you can still head to our website, sign up to our mailing list to be notified because we will be back next year. We'll start online, but who knows what will happen. We might have some special events in person and hopefully getting back to our regular event with the, you know, the food at the end and everything where we can actually hang out and celebrate. Um, and of course, this video and all of the past Briz Science videos are up online. And this one will go up on YouTube in about a week. So, you know, Christmas Day, you finish watching Love Actually, you're looking for what next to watch, pull up a Briz Science video. There'll be something on any topic in science that you can think of. And um, there's some fantastic speakers, as we've seen tonight. And if anybody's got, you know, $800 million lying around and would like to support some research, I can think of uh, eight fantastic candidates. So um, let us know. Otherwise, thank you all the Briz Science audience for coming. Um, huge shout out to the Briz Science organization team. Obviously, I'm sort of the face here, but there are people doing all of the work behind the scenes. And I just look pretty or as close as I can on the night. So thank you, um, Emma and everyone else for your fantastic work over this year. And thank you all our speakers tonight. You've done a fantastic job. Please, uh, Jordan, Leslie Orn, giving them a virtual round of applause. And uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. And we'll see you next year.